Hi, I'm Marlo from Wild Food UK, out foraging again on the 7th of January today. So we are in lockdown. I'm not far from my house and we're just doing a little bit of exercise. My wife's holding the camera whilst also having my nine month old baby strapped to her. So please forgive any little wobbles or squeaks in this part of the video. Uh, the rest of this video is gonna be made up of little shorts that I've put together over the last few months, focusing on cold hardy mushrooms that I think you guys should know about. Uh, there's some good forager mushrooms in this video and then a bunch of other mushrooms that I just find really, really interesting. So that's why they're in there. Uh, happy New Year, everyone. If you're watching this video, you've made it through 2020. What a rubbish year that was. Let's hope 2021 is uh, a lot better. Right, on to the mushrooms. We've got uh, an elder tree down here. You can see this light colored wood which some of you um, older subscribers to the channel might recognize because I've done a video here before and I am going to go over a bit of old ground in this video. Uh, and the old ground that I'm going to start off with is a, a mushroom that I've done a really long video about before because I find it one of the most interesting mushrooms in the country. If you want to find out more about the mushroom I'm going to show you, then look through the other videos in the channel. But it's just down here. Underneath there, growing out of this elder tree. Here's a, a younger one. A couple of little young ones. There's another young one. Gonna leave those young ones. Just pick a few of these and show you what we have. So they grow in shelves. And they're gray in color. These are quite small ones. And uh, they don't just grow out of elder, they grow out of almost any type of wood or wood type substrate, uh, chipboard, stair risers, you know. Um, I've seen them growing out of people's lovely new decking before. Uh, this is a grey oyster mushroom. And it's a mushroom that we go foraging for through the colder months of the year. You can find it at almost any time of year, but through January, February, March, this is a mushroom that we find more often. Um, so how do you ID it? It's quite simple. It grows out of wood in this shelf type system. And it's gray on top when young. And when you turn it over, you see these lovely gills that run all the way down the stem and back into the wood. There's a good example. Almost back into the wood that they're growing out of. Now we get a few different types of oyster mushroom in the UK. This is the gray one, Pleurotus ostriatus. Uh, we get a white one, we've got yellow ones and pink ones and slightly scurfy ones. There's one with a skirt. Uh, so it's a, a reasonable family for foragers because all of those ones that I mentioned are edible. Um, this is the one that I consider the safest though, uh, the gray oyster mushroom. It's also the most common. Uh, the gray oyster mushroom, when it gets to this size or bigger, has no lookalikes in the UK. The white one certainly does. There's a mushroom called the angel wings mushroom, which is uh, toxic. Uh, and that one looks almost identical superficially to the Pleurotus pulmonarius, the white oyster mushroom. And the pink ones and the yellow ones, they can look like other different extravagant oysterlings and other different types of uh, fungus that we get growing in the UK. Um, but the gray one, no poisonous lookalikes. Uh, apart from possibly, if you pick really small ones, you could mistake them for oysterlings. But oysterlings aren't really uh, a toxic mushroom or a highly toxic mushroom in most of my books. They're classed as inedible. Um, I wouldn't want to eat them. Uh, I don't know if they've been properly tested or the whole family's been properly tested for edibility, uh, but we don't want you eating oysterlings. Really, an oysterling, uh, it's, it has less of a stem it grows more like a shelf out the side of the tree that it's growing out of. And you would be very, very lucky if you found an oysterling mushroom of this size here. That's about, what, two, two and a half inches in diameter. Some of the oysterlings can get that big or even slightly bigger, but normally they're just growing as little shelves, probably no bigger than, let's say, 
that one there and you wouldn't really see the stem so it would be coming out of the tree a bit more like that don't worry about the oysterlings too much though uh, like I say they're not uh, a highly toxic mushroom um, but our oysters these are a great winter mushroom to know you can forage for these uh, through the whole year like I say but in winter and particularly January February March that's when we find them in the, the largest quantities and looking at their best Right, and here we have, on the same tree, which is elder, as I've said before, another good edible mushroom. This is one of our more common edibles in the UK, even more common than the oyster mushroom, because you find it on almost every bit of fallen elder uh, all year round. Um, at this time of year, through winter, that's when the woodier, this mushroom, is looking at its freshest. You can see these are nice succulent, almost jelly-like, and slightly ear-shaped mushrooms. <laughs> Sorry, did I ruin that close up there? <laughs> there you go. Uh, ear-shaped mushrooms. Now, growing out of elder with this colouring, hanging down never pointing upwards like a cup pointing up that differentiates these from other diseases which are uh, potentially toxic hanging down like that growing on elder and when you pick them looking very much like an ear uh, there's nothing else in the uk that it could be apart from a wood ear auricularia auriculari judei i think is its scientific name uh, now this is a mushroom that replaces your cloud ears uh, in all your oriental recipes it's a mushroom that i actually prefer to pick on the tree when it's dry because before you use them in the kitchen you generally want to dry them out anyway because this jelly-like texture will become very firm it will shrink down to you know maybe a fifth of this size when you uh, when you dry them out and then what you do with these is you rehydrate them in the dish that you're cooking so uh, if you were making some sort of miso soup you would rehydrate them in the miso stock um, they're not a mushroom that really lends itself to many Western recipes, although I have heard tell of people rehydrating them with orange juice and turning them into weird mushroom Jaffa cakes. And uh, I have rehydrated them myself with a chocolate sherry sauce and coated them in chocolate, which has made quite a nice uh, chocolate, sherry, boozy, mushroomy sweet. Um, probably not for everyone though. Uh, if you do a lot of oriental or far eastern cooking though this is a mushroom to know because you can buy a little tube of cloud ears from uh, supermarkets that I won't name for five pounds and upwards or you can just go to your nearest elder tree in the UK at any time of year and find this mushroom but in winter right now when it's cold there's actually ice which has melted in my hands. There was ice on this mushroom just now, but it still looks nice and fresh and healthy. Uh, so in winter, that's when you get them looking like this. Don't go to the supermarket, go to your local woodland. The foraging is good for your body and for your mind uh, and for your weekly shopping budget. And here we have a lovely, winter an early spring edible this is one of my favorites really look at that color it's the uh, scarlet elf cup or potentially the ruby elf cup uh, sarca cipher cochineer or sarca cipher ostriaca it doesn't matter uh, to a forager whether you've got the ruby, uh, the, ruby, the ruby or the scarlet elf cup because they're both equally as edible for us. Um, there's no real way that I know of anyway to tell the two of them uh, apart in the field. You need a microscope as far as I know. Um, but like I say, both nice and edible, both beautifully coloured and colour is going to be a bit of a theme through the rest of this video. We've got some of the most brightly coloured mushrooms in the country coming up to show you. Uh, this one though, 
might just about be the brightest. I'll let you decide. Uh, the Scarlet Elf Cup grows mainly on old hazel, but you find it in rotten leaf litter where there's lots of old bits of wood underground. Uh, I'm not sure it's exclusive to old bits of hazel. There's certainly loads of hazel around here, um, but it's a mushroom that when you find one of them, if you look around the area, you tend to find hundreds. So keep your eyes peeled for little hints of red in, uh, in amongst leaf litter and broken bits of wood when you're out for your walks in the next few weeks, through to March and even April. Um, I believe my colleague Eric even found some in May last year, so they can go into quite late spring. Um, they do often come up in November and December as well, so a nice long fruiting season for a very distinctive mushroom. You see it's cup shaped and it has a stem and you could just imagine a little elf drinking out of it, out of its own scarlet elf cup. Right, the rest of this video is gonna be kind of cobbled together uh, from what I've done over the last few months. So forgive the shoddy video editing, but I hope you like the content. But down here, we've got what is renowned as probably one of the most cold, hardy, edible mushrooms in the world, I'd say, probably. <laughs> this is our velvet shank. These are quite mature ones on top. And we've got this younger one down here. Let's have a look at this. So, oops, drop him. There's our velvet shank underneath. And there's our velvet shank on top. Now you can see it's growing out of a tree stump. Um, and this I know to be an old sycamore because I chopped it down. Uh, they'll grow out of lots of different types of broadleaf wood though. Um, this here is a mushroom that's obviously been up for a little while because the stem has started to discolour. They start off pretty orangey all the way down. You can see the gills on this young one are just kind of off-white. When very young, the cap of this mushroom will be orange all over, but these ones have been growing on this stump for probably about three weeks now, and, and they've been through some temperatures of minus five and some snow and some ice and some hail, so they've really been bearing up well to, to look as fresh and lovely as they are right now, but that's why the cap of this young one has slightly discolored. That will happen naturally as the mushrooms age and weather. Now these older ones, I'll pick this one down here, he's probably the oldest looking. I will expect to have pretty much a black stem. There you go. And you can see the gills have slightly discolored a little bit further from white, but the stem goes black. Now, looking at this, uh, as, as a whole, there's a few mushrooms that will grow in clumps and tufts out of tree stumps. Uh, at this time of year, you will see sulphur tufts. Now, sulphur tufts are toxic and they have uh, similarities in, in the way that they grow, a more yellowy cap, hence the sulphur tuft name. Um, but the sulphur tufts have gills which have this kind of strange olivaceous green iridescence if, if you like it's a bit of a weird thing you kind of look at the gills sideways and you see hints of green if you look at them straight on though they don't look too green now you can see the gills on this have no green to them whatsoever the sulfur tuft is poisonous but it's not deadly the most dangerous look-alike for this mushroom is easily the funeral bell and it's because of the funeral bell that we didn't put this mushroom in our book because it can look almost identical superficially. In fact, earlier on this year, I was running a course and I saw some mushrooms growing out the side of a tree and I went over thinking they were velvet shanks and said to the group, oh, look, looks like we've got some lovely edible mushrooms here. Uh, and I picked one and it wasn't a velvet shank. The only difference at that stage when they were young was that the uh, Gallerina marginata, the funeral bell, has a ring on the stem. So if you've got something that looks like a, uh, a velvet shank here, our Flamulina velutipes, but it has a skirt or a ring on the stem, 
leave it behind. It's a funeral bell. And that is a mushroom that's considered among the most toxic that we have in the UK. It is most certainly deadly. So our velvet shanks, no ring on the stem and a black stem as they mature. Although the gallerina can get a, a dark discoloration to the stem as well. Now this mushroom is really tasty. Uh, it's slightly past its best, this one, but the rest of these look to me like I should be picking them right now. Leave these young ones and see if they grow. And there is a group of beautiful velvet shanks. One of Right, so what do you do on a very cold November day when you're a forager? You come to the top of a giant hill, walk around some heathland. But it's worth it because you find some really, really fun things. We're looking for wax caps and other types of mushrooms. And here is a surprise, one that I wasn't expecting to see. Hoping the camera can pick it up. It's just like a little club. This is a cordycep. This is cordyceps militaris, which is uh, touted online as a wonder cure for many different things. You know, make of that what you will. Apparently it's good for everything uh, from living longer to increasing your libido. But like I say, make of that what you will. Uh, for me, it's just a really interesting family of mushrooms. It's a, a family of mushrooms that infest uh, living things. So there's one David Attenborough program which is fantastic and there's a, a species of cordyceps in that that infects an ant and it takes over the ant's brain, makes the, makes the ant climb to the highest point uh, it can get to in the uh, vicinity of where it is after it's been banned from its own little ant's nest by the, uh, the bouncer ants that have figured out that it's infected. So then this ant climbs to the top of a tree and uh, that point, at that point, the mushroom mummifies it and grows out of the ant's head, um, I assume, so that it can uh, spread its spores as far as possible from that high spot to infect some more ants. Now, there's a cordyceps for almost every type of grub in the UK, and this one grows out of uh, different uh, grubs from moths and caterpillars, most commonly, apparently. So what I'm gonna do is see if I can get down to that grub. Oh, it's actually quite near the surface by the looks of it. We'll see what this one's growing out of. Oh, not too far down. <laughs> well, whatever it was, There's the grub. It looks like some sort of beetle larvae or something like that. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll post this on one of the entomology groups online and see if they can figure out what type of grub it is. But there is your Cordyceps militaris. And this is one that you can grow at home. Uh, I know there's Cordyceps kits that you can buy. And uh, because of that, I think I'm gonna take this one home and see if I can clone it. Maybe in uh, one of my later videos, I'll show you the results of that. But there you can see this beautiful tongue or club shaped orange mushroom with these tiny sort of flocule like parts to the top. Not sure if my hand's steady enough for the camera to focus. But there you go. Cordyceps militaris. Growing out of some sort of grub. An interesting find, but not one for the plate, really. You wouldn't, uh... well, you could eat this, but you'd need a lot of them to make a meal. Let's go and find something else. Um, down here is uh, the most or one of the most common wax caps that we have in Britain. So we'll get this one out of the way. This is uh, the snowy wax cap. It's a white one that, as you can see, that's not much bigger than my thumb, but it'll get to, you know, three or four times that size. Uh, if I turn it over, you'll see decurrent gills. 
running down the stem. On a waxy mushroom growing in late autumn in grassland. Now, I can tell this mushroom and I do eat it, but I don't recommend it for novice foragers. Um, although it's a really common wax cap, it's one that has some really poisonous lookalikes. We have a, a white grassland mushroom called the Clytocybe rivulosa, which is deadly poisonous and it's reasonably similar. It will grow in similar places, and because of that, I'd just err on the side of caution with the snowy wax cap until you really know what you're doing. Here, Eric, can just take a step back. Just down here, we've got a mushroom that I've done a video on before. It's amazing, orange colored mushroom. This is called orange peel fungus. Alluria aurantia, and this is an edible mushroom, but it's nowhere near as tasty as some of the other mushrooms that I'm going to be finding or showing you today. So uh, the snowy wax caps I'm leaving behind because there's better stuff than them, and there's certainly better tasting mushrooms than these little orange peel fungus. They are very pretty, and I do eat them occasionally. You do have to cook them. And although they look quite flexible, they're actually quite brittle. So when you uh, pick them and cook them, they kind of fall apart in the frying pan. They're not the best of edibles, but there are better things around. So let's go and have a look for them. Now continuing with the bright color theme, We've got this mushroom down here. This is another wax cap. Is that the best shot we can get? Maybe if you take a shot from around here, you see the color a little bit more clearly. There you are. This is another beautiful wax cap. See it. Oh well, if I hold it up in the light, there you go, you can see it much more clearly. This beautiful red and yellow wax cap. Uh, this one with yellow gills uh, could be one of a couple really. It could be the uh, crimson wax cap or it could be the splendid wax cap. Lovely name. Um, either way, this isn't one that I normally collect. Uh, it is edible though. Um, most of the wax caps, for reasons I'll tell you in just a little while, we leave behind, apart from a few. Um, and the red ones, although they are edible, and I will collect them sometimes, I don't always because basically they're uh, prettier in the ground. But I'll pick this one so it can go in the bag. Now, have a little look there you can see white flesh in the stem. That's what tells me it's either the crimson or the splendid because there's another very red wax cap I'm going to show you in just a minute which uh, doesn't have white flesh. Now just over here past our slightly older crimson wax cap or red wax cap you can see they start to fade here's some more they start to go orange and then even paler as we can see on this one here now just uh, take a look at the stem though because this one orange on the cap could be mistaken for another good edible mushroom but the stem is still quite yellowy Bear that in mind for the future of this video. Now, another amazingly colorful mushroom. Um, this is just a color fest today. This is a beautifully adorned graveyard. Um, down here, we've got a truly gourmet edible mushroom. I'm gonna stop and spend a bit of time on this, get my knees wet, because uh, this is one that all of you guys need to know about. It's a, a really good edible. I'm just going to Cut it as low down as I can and show you the cap and underneath the cap that lovely lilac-y, almost purple colouring. 
Now this isn't a wax cap mushroom, this is a wood bluet. Um, and wood bluet are the sort of mushrooms that you can buy in places like Borough Market for an absolute fortune. Or you can just go out into almost any woodland at this time of year and pick your wood bluets because they're a very common mushroom. They're a saprophyte that loves growing on leaf litter of almost any type. So I find them, this is in grassland really, there's not much leaf litter around here. Um, so they're not even that fussy as to only grow in leaf litter, but that's their kind of ideal environment. Um, and they grow in all of the UK, in almost every woodland in the UK. If I go out at this time of year and don't find a bluet when I'm looking for them, I'm very disappointed. So really common and really tasty. Uh, they have this lovely coloration on the gills and the stem. So they get called blue legs. And in restaurants, uh, they use the French name as they <laughs> tend to, which is the pied bleu, pied bleu. On the cap, or the cap rather is, uh, it starts off quite purple when they're young, but it will discolor as you can see into a sort of tanny brown, a sort of slightly darker brown. And then it will fade into a pale, almost kind of lilac-y white in certain circumstances. Now, like I say, really common and really tasty and really safe too, because with that coloration, uh, there's only a few mushrooms that it could be, certainly at this time of year. So there are other members of the Bluet family. Uh, there's one called the Lepista Sordida, which is uh, pretty common and looks a lot like this. And I'm sure the mistake has been making by, making, <laughs> made by many foragers in the past, thinking they've got Bluets when they've picked Sordidas. Uh, no problem there, the Sordida is edible. It's just slightly more delicate, almost translucent at the edges of the cap, but I've probably picked them in the past thinking that they're bluets as well. Uh, there's a, a member of um, the webcap family, the bruising webcap, uh, Cortinarius purpurescens, I think, or purpureus. Uh, that looks a bit like this as well, although it's even more vibrant purple. Again, that's not a, a bad mistake to make because that one's eaten by some people. It's not considered highly toxic. Uh, I think it might give some people a tiny bit of gastric upset, uh, but it's not a dangerous mushroom. So at this time of year, if you've got this coloration, on a mushroom of this kind of size, you know, not a tiny little thin stemmed mushroom, then you've got more than likely anyway, one of the bluets. And uh, they've also got uh, the bluets anyway, not the bruising web cap, uh, quite a distinctive, almost perfumey smell. So a little sniff, it's not mushroomy, it's more kind of, like I say, perfumey. And uh, when you cook with these mushrooms as well, that'll come up from the pan. Um, also, when you cook with these mushrooms, they hold a lot of fluid, um, a lot of water. So if you're trying to do fried mushrooms with your bluets, what you have to do is keep kind of flicking the water out of the pan if you cook them fresh. Um, because a lot of water comes out of them and if you want fried mushrooms you have to flick that water out just to stop them in, stop them stewing basically. If you're making a, a mushroom sauce that water is actually quite useful and quite tasty though. Um, now this is uh, a little way into the season for bluets. I have a little tradition where I go out picking bluets on Christmas day and we find them in January and February as well. So take a look at this mushroom and remember this one look in leaf litter and particularly where the leaf litter hasn't been disturbed so i used to think these mushrooms uh used to grow with uh things like holly and and brambles because i would always find loads of them underneath holly and brambles uh, the reason for that though is that they're places where people don't walk so in the leaf litter that's in places that are undisturbed right now through November and December and January and possibly even February, you are likely to find yourself some bluets. You can also collect them up with loads of that leaf litter and uh, spread them around your garden. And apparently uh, that's called a bluet bomb. And uh, you can, by doing that, grow some of your own bluets. 
These are definitely a mushroom that's going in my foraging bag today. Uh, they're one of the real tasty ones, one of the real sought after foragers mushrooms. But there's more just around the corner, so we'll go off and have a look at those too. Before we do though, we'll have a look at some other interesting mushrooms first. It's not just wax caps and uh, other edibles that we're finding today, we're finding some really interesting stuff too. And uh, here's one of those that I would definitely put in the interesting category. Making this little grave here look very pretty. <laughs> These are the sort of flowers I'd like on my grave. So uh, when that happens, please plant some. Um, although planting these, and getting them going would be quite difficult. This is one of the uh, clavulinoids, I think is how you'd uh, pronounce it. Uh, I think this one might be clavulinopsis fusiformis. Um, it's in the clavaria sort of family of mushrooms and they're lovely to see because they're reasonably rare. They're part of uh, a system uh, called the Chegg system actually. Uh, which is used to grade pasture land and grassland. It's uh, Chegg is an acronym for Clavaria or Clavarioids. Uh, the H is for Hygrocybes, which is the wax caps that we're seeing today. E is for Entoloma and G is for Geoglossum. I'm not going to show you any Entolomas, but I will show you one little Geoglossum in a minute. And uh, what the Chegg scale is used for is to grade how natural, I suppose, any grassland or pasture pasture land is because certain uh, species of mushrooms within those genuses or families that I mentioned just will not grow in any grassland that's had any fertilizers or, or pesticides or fungicides used in that area. So by finding certain mushrooms in your grassland you can kind of without doing any soil tests just gauge how natural I suppose the area is. Uh, so yeah, that's the Chegg scale and uh, seeing as many hygrocybes, wax caps as we have today, uh, along with the geoglossums I'm going to show you and uh, this little clavaria that we've got here, or clavulinopsis, uh, means that what we've got is a really old, untouched bit of grassland. This is a special place and wax caps like we're seeing today don't grow in this profusion in many parts of the country. We're quite privileged in Herefordshire and Wales uh, to have the huge array of wax caps that we've got. That's because we've got so much uh, untouched pasture land around here, but because that kind of land in the UK is shrinking, we're using more chemicals in our farming and more of our farmland is being built on and you know basically habitat loss means that quite a lot of our wax caps like the crimson that I showed you a little while ago and the scarlet they're they're mushrooms that might well end up being rare in years to come and there are some wax caps that are already on the red list that's why I keep saying stick to the more common ones Anyway, uh, one chemical that they obviously don't seem to mind is embalming fluid. Um, Here we are. These are the G's from your Chegg scale. These are some of our geoglossums. Little black tongue fungus growing out the ground. You can see dotted all over the place. Now there is a mushroom called Dead Man's Fingers, which uh, would be quite apt to be growing out the ground in a graveyard. Uh, this isn't dead man's fingers though. Dead man's fingers grow out of tree stumps. Now, don't eat the geoglossums or your dead man's fingers. There's just mushrooms everywhere in this place at the moment. This is another one of those clavarias. I think this is Clavaria fumosa. Again, indicating that we've got ground here that's not been touched by chemicals um, in, the, in the recent past. And beside it, we've got probably, for me anyway, the most beautiful of the wax caps. Well, there's a, well, it's a, a little group of the red wax caps that I consider to be absolutely stunning. Uh, I'm reasonably sure that this is the scarlet wax cap, um, but over here we've got a baby showing a little bit of yellow at the bottom of the stem. Got another little youngster there. 
and these amazing coloured ones here. Now, uh, a way of differentiating, showing that you've got the scarlet wax cap over the uh, crimson and the and the splendid is, as I showed you with the crimson, there'd be white flesh there. And hopefully what we'll see is the flesh, not the gills, the fleshy part of the mushroom is bright red. And I think that means that we've got a scarlet. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I do like looking at these mushrooms, but I, I'm not picking the rest of these. I'll take this one home because they are edible, uh, but I leave most of the scarlets behind because while the scarlets are around, there's normally a better one just around the corner, which I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Alright, sorry about the chainsaw noise in the background. We've been waiting here about 10 minutes. Wow, listen to that. As soon as we start filming, he's stopped. That's perfect. Uh, here's some more of our wax caps, just quickly before he starts up again. Probably the crimson. Wax caps everywhere around here. This graveyard's been a fantastic find. These are some little orange wax caps. Could be the miniata, wet. Normally the miniata's got a kind of scurfy top. But here's something that's not a wax cap and is a good edible. These are our goblets. Pseudoclytocybe cyathiformis. Now I don't know if it's one organism, but if you follow this round here, past even more wax caps, we've got this beautiful one here. And then some more here. And I'm just gonna pick this one and show you. Now the goblet is a good safe edible. You can see this fibrous stem with this coloring and the goblet shaped cap. Now at this time of year, this is a, a nice, safe, good edible to go looking for, but not as good as my favorite find of the day, which is just down here. These are our meadow wax caps. And in every stage of growth, really. So we'll pick this little one first and show you. There's our orange capped meadow wax cap with the stout stem, which is just slightly off white, a little bit orangey. And the gills are a lighter shade of orange than the cap. This is how they start off. This is how they develop. see the gills are quite decurrent actually on the young one or at least they look quite decurrent but as they mature they become less so and very widely spaced and then eventually they'll look like this one those gills have gone very decurrent again they're variable nice orange cap lighter than when young the lighter gills and the lighter stem. Now, uh, this is Cuphophilus pretensis. It used to be a hygrocybe, but they've farmed it off into uh, another genus, uh, Cuphophilus. And uh, I think that might be because it's not actually that closely related to the wax caps. It's one that doesn't mind uh, chemicals being used quite so much. So this is a really common mushroom in our meadows all over the UK. I, I do also find it in woodland as well, which uh, always surprises me and worries me a little bit. So I don't tend to pick them from woodland because I know they're supposed to grow in grassland, but I do find them, I'm pretty sure, in woodland as well. The meadow wax cap doesn't have a waxy texture at all when you cook it. It's just a really lovely mushroomy mushroom. And when you find them, you often find them in profusion. There's about 20 in this little group here, and there's a lot more in the field just around us. So out of the wax cap family, I'd like you to leave most of them behind. Just look out for the snowies, and when you're sure of your ID with the snowies, go for those. Uh, and the meadow wax cap is one that I think everyone should go foraging for. They're uh, a really common mushroom and really, really tasty. So a lovely one to finish on, but there's just one more that I want to show you before we finish.
And here we are, this is where I wanted to finish just because it's such a showstopper. I did just introduce you to the meadow wax cap. I'm now gonna introduce you to the king of all meadow wax caps. Down here is the biggest one that Eric and I have ever found. That is a meadow wax cap to match all others. And he's still got ice on the top. These are mushrooms that can take a bit of freezing. At this time of year, that kills most other mushrooms off. So there we go. There's a haul of some of our meadow wax caps. This one obviously got a bit tied down. Look at how crazily he's grown, round in a big circle. And some more beauties all around here. There you go. Right, I'll finish off with this. And uh, there was one with a huge stem as well, Eric. Where was that one? Just there. Oh, there you go. Another lovely meadow wax cap. My favorite finds of the day. So just to finish off, I don't normally do this, but like I said at the beginning of the video, we've got a lot of new subscribers. So I just wanted you all to know we're an educational company. We teach people about wild food all over the UK. We go everywhere from Dartmoor and Kent up to Scotland and lots of different places in the middle as well, running our courses. And we've also written a book, which I want you all to know about because we're very proud of it. The Foraging Pocket Guide, which does just about fit in a reasonable size pocket. Uh, I hope you've liked this video. I'm gonna try and do more videos like this as often as I can, but I'm also gonna still keep doing all those little shorts as well, just to put into our website. So thank you very much for watching. If you uh, like the video, please click the like button. That's something to be happy about. Uh, so are the mushrooms that I've been finding uh, today and over the last couple of months though. So I'll show you some of those cold hardy mushrooms now. And uh, the rest of the videos, uh, or the rest of this video is kind of a little bit cobbled together from the other times I've been able to get out. Um, please forgive the sketchy video editing as well. Now I'm gonna start off with a really common edible that I've done a video, a video about before I start again. Happy New Year, everyone. If you're watching this, you've made it through 2020. So that's a good thing. Uh, since we're in lockdown, my wife is holding the camera at the same time as holding my nine month old baby who you might be able to hear squeaking. Oh, little bubba dubba. Dubba dubba dubba. If I look at her, is it because I was looking at the camera, not at you? Oh, do you want to wear her? No, because that would be just weird. Wouldn't it? Should we hang her from a tree? <laughs>